plate tectonics and plate models. I will tackle the subject, plate tectonics and plate models, in a two-pronged attack. In this video lecture, I will present the theory of plate tectonics following its historical development. The second video is fully dedicated to the topic plate models. I prefer to present plate tectonics as a history because it shows how different pieces, apparently disconnected, ended up fitting the puzzle, forming a magnificent mosaic. I end up the video making reference to the Nouvelle One geophysical plate model in order to make a link to the next video on plate models. The German meteorologist and geophysicist Alfred Wegener is credited as being the first to formulate a complete statement of the continental drift hypothesis. Like many before him, since more accurate maps became available in the 16th century, Wegener noticed the similarity in the coastlines between eastern South America and western Africa. Wegener speculated that the continents had once been joined together. Others had speculated the same based on fossil records, such as the French geographer Antonius Snyder Pellegrini in the 19th century, and the Austrian geologist Edward Suez also at the 19th century. Suez suggested the name Gondwana to indicate a single enormous southern continent. In 1910, Wegener started to develop the idea that in the late Paleozoic era, which ended about 252 million years ago, all the present-day continents formed a single supercontinent, which had subsequently broken apart. Wegener called this ancient continent Pangaea. His idea of continental drift was formulated in his major published work, the Origin of Continents and Oceans, in 1915. Wegener presented evidence that continents had drifted not on what caused them to move. The concept of continental drift should not be taken as synonymous with plate tectonics, even though plate tectonics encompasses the idea of continental drift and derives much of its impact from it. Wegener's idea suffered strong opposition, even from a geophysicist of the magnitude of Sir Harold Jeffries. Jeffries claimed the impossibility of convection in the Earth's mantle. For those who do not know who Jeffries was, he co-authored the standard tables of earthquake waves travel times and was the first to demonstrate that the Earth's core is liquid, among other contributions to astronomy and mathematics. Nonetheless, evidence started to pile up in favor of a new theory, plate tectonics. Plate tectonics is like a mosaic, as it is formed based on several pieces apparently disconnected. It is interesting to look at it as history progresses, and the pieces start to fit together with time. During the 1950s and 1960s, isotopic dating of rocks based on radioactive decay indicated that crystalline massifs of Precambrian age from about 4.6 billion to 541 million years ago, found on opposite sides of the South Atlantic, corresponded in age and composition, as Wegener had speculated. The period of World War II witnessed the intensity of mapping of the seafloor as submarines needed safer data for their navigation. Key names associated with this effort are oceanographer Bruce C. Heisen, oceanic cartographer Mary Tharp, and geologist Henry W. Menard, all of them Americans. These activities continued after the war, culminating in the discovery of ocean ridges and ocean trenches. Ocean ridges are large oceanic mountain ranges with narrow central valleys extending the length of an entire ocean. They connect to other mid-oceanic ridges in a phenomenal extension around our entire planet. Ocean trenches are deep-sea trenches, thousands of kilometers long and several kilometers deep. They are often found at the edges of continent or along island chains. Most of them are in the Pacific Ocean. 
Another interesting finding was that the seafloor sediment layer was much thinner and much younger than expected. Sediment samples were no more than 180 million years old as compared to the age of continental crust, measured in billions of years. American geologist Harry Hess outlined a theory that explained the lack of old oceanic crust in 1962. This theory is known as theory of seafloor spreading. Hess's theory states that hot magma from the Earth's mantle rises through the mid-oceanic ridges, cooling down and continuously producing new seafloor. This newly formed ocean crust is carried away from the mid-oceanic ridge by the spreading seafloor as if moving along a conveyor belt. The seafloor is recycled millions of years later when it descends into the mantle by diving into the deep ocean trenches, a process known as subduction. Persuasive evidence to support seafloor spreading soon followed Hess's hypothesis. Then enter paleomagnetism in scene. Paleomagnetism states that the direction and inclination of magnetism of an iron-bearing mineral or rock, such as magnetite, can tell us where the mineral or rock was formed with respect to the magnetic pole. In the 1950s, there was a discovery of ancient rocks whose magnetic directions and inclinations did not correspond with the present magnetic pole position. Magnetic studies revealed that the ocean floor was comprised of parallel bands of crust having alternated magnetic polarity. These magnetic bands were symmetrical about the mid-oceanic ridge. Normal magnetic polarity means magnetic orientation the same as that of Earth's current field. Reversed magnetic polarity means magnetic orientations in rock that are opposite to the current orientation of Earth's magnetic field. This symmetric pattern of magnetic stripes on either side of the mid-ocean ridges was used in independent and simultaneous work by two British geologists, Frederick Vine and Drummond Matthews, and by Canadian geologist Lawrence Morley. They also observed that the dates of the basalts of the seafloor were found to be of the same age at similar distances away from the ridge on each side. This suggested that the ocean floor was created at the mid-ocean ridges and then was spilt in half by later activity and pushed sideways. Their discovery became known as the vine matthews morley hypothesis, the first scientific proof of seafloor spreading and a crucial development in the theory of plate tectonics. A curiosity involves Morley's work. His paper containing his conclusions was rejected. Explaining his decision, the journal's referee acidly noted that the idea contained in the paper might be of interest for, open quote, talk at cocktail parties, but it is not the sort of thing that ought to be published under serious scientific aegis, end quote. In 1968, drilling started to be used to gather samples of rocks from the ocean floor, confirming age and magnetic polarity. Later missions to the mid-Atlantic ridge by strong pressured hull submersibles discovered rocks called pilolavas, such rocks can only form from cooled molten material, confirming the creation of new ocean crust at the mid-oceanic ridges. Canadian geophysicist John Tuzo Wilson proposed two important ideas in support of the theory of plate tectonics. To explain why active volcanoes are found many thousands of kilometers from the nearest plate boundary, Tuzo Wilson, in 1963, proposed that plates might move over fixed hotspots in the mantle, forming volcanic island chains like Hawaii. In 1965, Tuzo Wilson followed this discovery with the idea of a third type of plate boundary the transform fault, also known as transform boundary or conservative plate boundaries, since plate material is neither created nor destroyed. 
transform faults were regarded as the missing piece in the puzzle of plate tectonic theory. A transform fault slips horizontally along a plate boundary, ending abruptly where it connects to another plate boundary, being either another transform fault, an oceanic ridge spreading divergent boundary, or an ocean trench subduction convergent boundary. They allowed for plates to slide past each other without any oceanic crust being created or destroyed. The most famous example is probably the San Andreas Fault between the North American and Pacific plates. But there was still the need to formalize the driving mechanism of plate tectonics. In 1966, British ge geophysicist Dan Mackenzie suggested a model for a far more dynamic Earth than anyone had previously thought. He suggested the existence of two layers in the mantle, both in motion, controlling the movement and behavior of the tectonic plates above. An interesting fact about subduction in the Pacific Ocean and in the Atlantic Ocean. Remember that subduction is a process by which the ocean floor sinks beneath a deep ocean trench and returns to the mantle. As there are many trenches in the Pacific Ocean, it is getting smaller. As there are fewer trenches in the Atlantic Ocean, it is getting wider. Plate tectonics explains several important features of our planet, such as mountain building, island arcs, and the location of most earthquake epicenters and volcanoes. Geophysical evidence started to be used to map the velocity with which the plates move over a few million years. Mathematically, it can be modeled by Euler's theorem on the movement of a rigid body across the surface of a sphere. More recently, the continuous use of space geodet techniques has allowed the estimation of the velocity of the plates, but for a shorter period of time. A few models incorporate both geophysical evidence and geodetic measurements. One of the earliest geophysical models is Nouvel-1. Nouvel-1 is a global relative plate motion model which combines data from around the world to find motion of 12 major plates. It combines 277 seafloor spreading rates, 121 transform directions, and 724 earthquake slip vectors. Some motions are derived using data from other plates by plate circuit closure. It is used to describe the average plate motions over the past 3 million years. Its plate motions have been used in comparisons to shorter-term motions from earthquakes and space geodesy. This is the end of part 1. In the next video lecture, I will continue dealing with plate models, presenting and discussing geophysical and geodetic velocity models.